Hello, dear listeners. You're tuned in to the Sexual Health Podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Ian Storm. Today, we have a very important topic to discuss with our wonderful guest, Professor Nicholas Schneider, a leading expert in psychiatry. Professor Schneider is a person with vast experience and deep knowledge in his field, and he has kindly agreed to share his insights on paranoid personality disorder with us. Paranoid personality disorder, or PPD, is a complex and often misunderstood condition. People with this disorder may experience profound mistrust of others and often perceive threats where there are none. This condition can significantly impact their daily lives, work, and relationships with loved ones. In today's episode, we will take a detailed look at what paranoid personality disorder entails, what symptoms characterize it, how it is diagnosed, and which treatment methods are most effective. Professor Schneider will share his experiences working with patients who suffer from this disorder and provide valuable advice for those dealing with similar issues in their own lives or the lives of their loved ones. So, if you want to learn more about paranoid personality disorder and understand how to help those who are affected, stay tuned. Professor Schneider, welcome to our podcast, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ian, for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here and discuss such an important topic. Professor Schneider, let's start with the basics. What is paranoid personality disorder, and what are the primary symptoms that characterize it? Well, let's delve into the intriguing and complex mental condition known as paranoid personality disorder, or PPD. Imagine walking into a room where people are chatting and smiling. You have no reason to be concerned. But what if you began to perceive every glance, every word, every gesture as a threat or manipulation? This is the reality for individuals suffering from PPD. It's not just occasional moments of suspicion that anyone might experience. It is a persistent and profound mistrust of others that permeates every aspect of their lives. Imagine someone who interprets even the most innocent actions as threats. For instance, if someone compliments your work, you might think, oh, this person is actually mocking me, or they're trying to manipulate me. Remarkable, isn't it? So why does this happen? People with PPD tend to believe that others have malicious intentions and want to harm or deceive them, even when there is no objective reason for such beliefs. It's akin to wearing dark glasses that distort everything you see. You perceive the world not as it is, but through these distorting glasses of suspicion. The manifestations of PPD extend beyond mere distrust. There is an excessive sensitivity to rejection and frequent conflicts with others. Think of it this way. If you fear betrayal every second, it naturally becomes difficult to build and maintain trusting relationships. For individuals with PPD, even long-term acquaintances do not guarantee trust. They constantly live in a state of anticipation that someone will soon let them down or betray them. Consider what it's like to live in a constant state of fear and suspicion. It not only impacts interpersonal relationships, but also the overall quality of life. Reflect on this the next time you encounter someone displaying such traits. You'll see that behind every action lies a profound sense of threat and fear that shapes their perception of the world. So let's delve into what exactly people with paranoid personality disorder experience. Let's imagine a situation. You're in a circle of friends and someone compliments you on your work. On the surface, everything should seem fine, right? However, for someone with paranoid personality disorder, this compliment might be perceived quite differently. They might see it as insincere, sarcastic, or even an attempt at manipulation. You might think, could they be trying to set me up? How does that sound? Let's explore why this happens. People with PPD live in a world where every word and action from others is viewed as a potential threat. Their distrust isn't limited to strangers. It extends to close friends, colleagues, and even family members. If you're in their life and show kindness, it might trigger their suspicion rather than gratitude. Imagine constantly expecting deceit from everyone around you. This persistent mistrust makes every interaction with others challenging and tense. You might notice that even a simple offer of help can be seen as a hidden threat. It's not that they don't want to trust you, it's that they are in a continuous state of perceived danger. But that's not all. People with PPD are extremely sensitive to criticism and rejection. 
Let's consider how this plays out in real life. Even the slightest remark can be taken as a serious insult. This can lead to deep resentment, outbursts of anger, or even prolonged grudges. It's astonishing how fleeting words can provoke such intense reactions. Imagine making an innocent comment and someone with PPD perceives it as a personal affront. They may ruminate over it for a long time and find it hard to let go of the hurt. Moreover, individuals with PPD tend to search for hidden meanings in neutral or kind actions. If someone offers them help, they might think it's not a genuine offer, but a covert attempt at manipulation. This creates a constant sense of danger and mistrust towards the surrounding world. Every action or word from others can be interpreted as a potential threat. Thus, people with PPD live in a state of constant vigilance, where every moment and every interaction is filled with doubt and suspicion. This condition significantly complicates their ability to form and maintain close relationships, as trust is the foundation of any successful interaction. So how common is paranoid personality disorder? It might seem that this condition is relatively rare affecting about 2 to 4% of the general population. But let's consider a concrete example. Imagine you're in a group of 100 people. Statistically, two or four individuals in that group might suffer from paranoid personality disorder. While this percentage may seem small, even a few cases can have a significant impact on the lives of those affected and those around them. Paranoid personality disorder is not specific to any particular gender or age group. Although it is more commonly diagnosed in men, no one is immune to this disorder. Typically, the first signs start to emerge in young adulthood, but they can sometimes go unnoticed until they severely affect a person's life. Imagine someone living in a constant state of mistrust and suspicion for years, unaware that these feelings are symptoms of a disorder. One of the main reasons it's challenging to identify PPD is that many of its symptoms might appear as normal personality traits or responses to life circumstances. For example, if someone constantly suspects others of manipulation, this might be seen as mere vigilance or excessive caution. In reality, it could be a sign of a serious disorder. This is why it's crucial to be aware of the signs and symptoms of PPD. Familiarity with these indicators allows for early recognition of the problem and helps individuals seek assistance and support. The sooner the disorder is identified, the better the chances for improving the quality of life. And remember, your understanding and support can play a decisive role in the life of someone suffering from PPD. We continue our in-depth analysis of paranoid personality disorder and move on to the next important question. At what age do the first symptoms of paranoid personality disorder typically appear? Typically, the first symptoms of paranoid personality disorder emerge during adolescence or early adulthood. Imagine the ages between 18 and 30, when young people face numerous new challenges and transitions. This period is when symptoms can begin to manifest quite subtly. Suspicions and mistrust might be perceived merely as personality traits, which certainly complicates the early recognition of the disorder, doesn't it? Consider the transition to adulthood starting college, entering the workforce, or joining new social circles. All these events can serve as triggers for the onset of PPD symptoms. Isn't it true that these life changes can exacerbate existing tendencies towards suspicion and distrust? Let me emphasize that symptoms such as chronic suspicion and interpreting neutral actions as hostile can gradually intensify over time if not addressed through treatment and management. You might notice how friends or relatives become increasingly isolated, struggle with communication, and constantly anticipate negative actions from those around them. Do any of these descriptions remind you of someone close to you? This is why early recognition and intervention are crucial. Imagine how improving the quality of life for someone can be achieved by spotting signs of paranoid personality disorder at an early stage and seeking professional help in a timely manner. Early assistance can significantly enhance life and help manage symptoms more effectively. Are there differences in the manifestations of paranoid personality disorder between men and women? Let's delve into the differences in how paranoid personality disorder manifests between men and women. This is indeed a fascinating and important aspect of understanding the disorder. 
While the core symptoms remain similar, their presentation can vary significantly. Imagine a man with PPD. Often these men may exhibit symptoms in a more aggressive and overt manner. They tend to engage in active conflicts, always in a state of readiness as if expecting threats around every corner. You might have encountered individuals like this who frequently clash at work, at home, or even in public places. Their suspicion can be so pronounced that they start monitoring others, making unfounded accusations and controlling every action. It's almost like a scene from a detective thriller, isn't it? Now let's consider women with PPD. Their manifestations might be more subtle and indirect. Picture a woman who avoids certain people or situations because she perceives them as threats. In social interactions, these women may display a high degree of vigilance and mistrust, but their reactions are typically less aggressive. It resembles a spy thriller where the protagonist acts quietly and cautiously, trying not to draw attention. Interestingly, women with PPD might also show symptoms overlapping with other disorders, such as anxiety or depression. Imagine how challenging it can be to recognize PPD when its symptoms are masked by anxiety or depression. This truly complicates diagnosis and demands special attention from professionals. However, it's crucial to remember that PPD manifests individually in each person. Gender differences are not absolute. Both men and women can experience a wide range of symptoms. Therefore, the approach to diagnosis and treatment should be personalized, taking into account the unique characteristics of each patient. That was the fifth question of our episode. Stay with us to learn more about the manifestations and nuances of paranoid personality disorder. What risk factors might contribute to the development of paranoid personality disorder? Well, imagine we're putting together a puzzle where each piece represents a different risk factor, and only by assembling them all can we see the full picture. Let's start with genetics. Like many other mental disorders, PPD can be inherited. Have you ever wondered why some people share the same traits or predispositions as their parents or siblings? That's genetics at work. If someone in your close family, such as parents or siblings, has been diagnosed with PPD or another mental disorder, your risk of developing this disorder may be higher. Genetics plays a significant role in shaping our personality and predisposition to mental health conditions. Next, consider early life experiences. Traumatic events in childhood, such as physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, can leave a profound impact on our mental health. Imagine a child who has endured abuse. They may grow up feeling a constant sense of danger and hostility from the world around them. Isn't this an ideal breeding ground for developing paranoid traits? Social conditions also play a crucial role. Picture growing up in an environment of constant instability or threat, such as during armed conflicts or social isolation. These conditions can make you more prone to developing PPD. When your surroundings instill a sense of danger and distrust, how can you not become suspicious? Finally, consider personality factors. Individuals with certain personality traits, such as high anxiety or low self-esteem, may be more vulnerable to developing PPD. These traits can exacerbate tendencies towards suspicion and mistrust, especially in stressful or unpredictable situations. Imagine constantly doubting yourself and feeling threatened at every turn. Thus, the development of paranoid personality disorder results from a complex interplay of genetic, psychological, and social factors. Understanding these risk factors aids not only in diagnosis and treatment, but also in prevention. I hope this puzzle has become a bit clearer and more understandable for you. All right, now let's discuss the question. To what extent does genetic predisposition influence the likelihood of developing paranoid personality disorder? Imagine you have close relatives who have been diagnosed with paranoid personality disorder. In this case, your risk of developing the disorder might be higher. Why? Because genetics significantly contributes to the predisposition for PPD. But let's not panic. Genetic predisposition is not a death sentence. It's just one of the factors that may influence the development of the disorder. The impact of genetics on PPD is complex and always interacts with other factors. For instance, traumatic events in early childhood, chronic stress, and adverse family conditions can substantially increase the risk of developing the disorder. 
This interaction creates an individual predisposition to PPD. Let me explain this with an example. Imagine you have a genetic predisposition to PPD, but you grew up in a loving and supportive family with minimal stress. In this case, your likelihood of developing the disorder may be significantly lower compared to someone with the same genetic predisposition who grew up in unfavorable conditions. Research in genetics and mental health shows that genetic predisposition may be linked to disruptions in certain neurochemical systems and structural features of the brain. These changes may contribute to the onset of PPD symptoms. However, the exact genetic markers and mechanisms influencing the development of PPD are still not fully understood. Science continues to work on uncovering these mysteries, and in the future, we may gain a better understanding of how genetics affects our mental health. So what do we have? Genetic predisposition is an important but not the only factor in the development of paranoid personality disorder. The interaction of genetic and environmental factors creates individual risks, and each case requires considering multiple variables. Remember, genetics is just part of the story. Your life circumstances, early experiences, and personal traits also play a crucial role in shaping your mental health. All right, now let's discuss the question. To what extent does genetic predisposition influence the likelihood of developing paranoid personality disorder? Imagine you have close relatives who have been diagnosed with paranoid personality disorder. In this case, your risk of developing the disorder might be higher. Why? because genetics significantly contributes to the predisposition for PPD. But let's not panic. Genetic predisposition is not a death sentence. It's just one of the factors that may influence the development of the disorder. The impact of genetics on PPD is complex and always interacts with other factors. For instance, traumatic events in early childhood, chronic stress, and adverse family conditions can substantially increase the risk of developing the disorder. This interaction creates an individual predisposition to PPD. Let me explain this with an example. Imagine you have a genetic predisposition to PPD, but you grew up in a loving and supportive family with minimal stress. In this case, your likelihood of developing the disorder may be significantly lower compared to someone with the same genetic predisposition who grew up in unfavorable conditions. Research in genetics and mental health shows that genetic predisposition may be linked to disruptions in certain neurochemical systems and structural features of the brain. These changes may contribute to the onset of PPD symptoms. However, the exact genetic markers and mechanisms influencing the development of PPD are still not fully understood. Science continues to work on uncovering these mysteries, and in the future, we may gain a better understanding of how genetics affects our mental health. So what do we have? Genetic predisposition is an important but not the only factor in the development of paranoid personality disorder. The interaction of genetic and environmental factors creates individual risks, and each case requires considering multiple variables. Remember, genetics is just part of the story. Your life circumstances, early experiences, and personal traits also play a crucial role in shaping your mental health. Thank you for staying with us. In the next segment, we will explore other important aspects of paranoid personality disorder. Don't go away. We continue our discussion on paranoid personality disorder. Our next question concerns the diagnosis of this disorder. How is paranoid personality disorder diagnosed? What methods are used? Let me explain with an example. Imagine you visit a psychiatrist or psychologist. Your meeting begins with an in-depth conversation where the specialist listens carefully to understand your inner world and identify signs of the disorder. This conversation is crucial for observing manifestations of distrust and suspicion, which are key symptoms of paranoid personality disorder. For example, you might describe situations where you were convinced that others were deceiving or manipulating you, even when there was no clear evidence to support that belief. But the diagnosis doesn't end there. The specialist gathers your medical history to understand when the symptoms began, how severe they are, and how they affect your daily life. Imagine how important it is to understand how symptoms complicate your social interactions, professional activities, and personal relationships. The more information collected, the more accurate the diagnosis will be. 
Various assessment tools are used for a more detailed analysis and to confirm the diagnosis. Psychological tests such as the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, MMPI, or specific scales for paranoid symptoms help objectively evaluate personality traits and identify signs of paranoid disorder. Think of this as an x-ray for your psyche, allowing you to see hidden aspects of your inner world. Structured or semi-structured interviews, specifically designed for diagnosing personality disorders, are also employed. These tools help systematize information and ensure a more precise alignment with diagnostic criteria. Think of this as a guide that helps the specialist gather all the necessary information to avoid missing important details. Another critical stage in the diagnosis is ruling out other possible causes of the symptoms. For instance, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder can have similar signs. The specialist conducts differential diagnosis to ensure that the symptoms are indeed related to paranoid personality disorder and not another mental condition. This is like a detective investigation where all other possible options must be ruled out. Sometimes, it is also helpful to obtain information from the patient's close relatives. This can provide additional insight into how symptoms manifest in everyday life and how they are perceived by others. Close individuals may notice aspects that the patient might overlook or not consider significant. Imagine that your friends or family could become important witnesses in this process. In conclusion, diagnosing paranoid personality disorder requires a thorough and comprehensive approach. The specialist bases their conclusions on symptom analysis, medical history, and assessment tool data. Such a detailed approach helps to make an accurate diagnosis and choose the most effective treatment. I hope this gives you a clearer understanding of how the process works. Step by step, as we continue our fascinating discussion on paranoid personality disorder, we have arrived at the question of treatment. So, Professor, what are the most effective treatment methods for paranoid personality disorder? Treatment of paranoid personality disorder indeed requires a personalized approach, as each manifestation of this disorder is unique. Imagine that each patient is a complex puzzle, and therapy must find the keys to each piece of this puzzle. There are several methods that can genuinely help patients, and today I will tell you about them. First and foremost, psychotherapy plays a central role in treating PPD. One of the most effective methods is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. During CBT, patients learn to recognize and change their distorted and negative thoughts that lead to paranoid beliefs. Imagine a patient who believes that his colleagues at work are constantly plotting against him. In therapy, he learns to consider alternative explanations for his thoughts, thereby reducing his level of anxiety. CBT not only helps change thoughts but also manage emotions and respond to stressful situations less acutely. Therapists provide exercises to develop social adaptation skills and conflict resolution. These are especially important for people with PPD who find it difficult to communicate and establish relationships. These skills can significantly improve the patient's quality of life, helping them cope better with daily challenges. Another important method is trust-oriented therapy. Imagine a patient coming to a therapist feeling fear and distrust. Here, a safe and supportive atmosphere is created between the patient and the therapist. For people with PPD who may perceive the therapist as a threat, this is critically important. The therapist uses techniques to gradually build trust and encourage openness. This may take time, but this approach helps patients open up and work more effectively on their issues. However, sometimes psychotherapy alone is not enough, and medication can come to the rescue. If the patient exhibits accompanying symptoms, such as high anxiety or depression, antidepressants may be prescribed. These medications alleviate symptoms of depression and anxiety, contributing to overall improvement and reduction of paranoid ideas. For more severe symptoms, antipsychotic medications may be used. They help reduce the intensity of paranoid thoughts and lower anxiety levels. However, the use of these medications requires careful monitoring due to possible side effects. The doctor carefully adjusts the dosage and monitors the patient's condition to avoid complications. Social support and skills training also play a significant role. Patients can participate in group therapies or training sessions where they interact with others facing similar problems. 
Support from loved ones and participation in support groups are also very important. Imagine how crucial it is to feel that you are not alone in your problems. Interacting with people who face similar difficulties can be very helpful and supportive. Finally, a key aspect of treating PPD is the individualized approach. Each patient is unique and treatment must be tailored to their specific needs. Specialists work closely with patients to find the most suitable methods of therapy and medication, constantly monitoring and adjusting the treatment plan according to the patient's condition. Thus, treating paranoid personality disorder is a complex and individualized process. Gradually overcoming distrust and working on changing negative thoughts can significantly improve the patient's quality of life and their ability to interact with others. Continuing our discussion on treatment, let's delve into the role of psychotherapy in managing paranoid personality disorder. Professor, could you explain how important psychotherapy is and how it assists individuals with this disorder? Well, that's a very important question. Psychotherapy plays a central role in the treatment of paranoid personality disorder. And here's why. Paranoid personality disorder is characterized by strong distrust and suspicion of others. These traits can severely complicate the patient's life and interactions, but this is where psychotherapy becomes crucial. One of the first and most important tasks of psychotherapy for PPD is establishing a trusting relationship between the patient and the therapist. Imagine a person living in constant fear and suspicion, always expecting deceit from those around them. For such a person, opening up to anyone, even a professional, is extremely difficult. It requires great patience and persistence from the therapist to create a safe and supportive environment where the patient can begin to trust. This is the first and critically important step towards recovery. One of the most effective methods for working with patients with PPD is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. In CBT, patients are helped to recognize and change their distorted and negative thoughts that reinforce paranoid beliefs. Imagine a patient who believes that their colleagues at work are constantly plotting against them. The therapist works to help them consider alternative, less anxiety-provoking explanations, which helps reduce their level of anxiety. CBT focuses on changing the patient's thinking. This includes working with cognitive distortions, such as catastrophizing, expecting the worst outcome, or generalization, applying one negative experience to all aspects of life. The therapist helps the patient develop a more realistic and balanced view of situations. The patient starts to understand that their interpretations may be incorrect and learns to consider other, less threatening explanations. In addition to working on thinking, Psychotherapy may also include social skills training. Patients with PPD often experience difficulties in interpersonal relationships, which only exacerbates their suspicion and distrust. The therapist helps the patient develop effective communication and conflict resolution skills. This may involve practical exercises, such as role-playing, where the patient can practice new ways of interacting and responding to social situations. Such exercises help the patient feel more confident in real life. Psychotherapy provides patients with an opportunity to receive emotional support and learn to manage stress. Paranoid disorder can be extremely draining, leading to high levels of stress and anxiety. The therapist helps the patient develop strategies for managing these emotions and stress, as well as providing support during difficult times. This may include relaxation methods, breathing exercises, and other techniques that help reduce stress and anxiety. Working with patients with PPD also involves improving their self-esteem and self-acceptance. People with this disorder may feel vulnerable and incapable of handling situations. The therapist helps the patient build their self-confidence and develop a positive perception of their abilities and worth. This is important for building healthier and more harmonious relationships with others. Finally, psychotherapy facilitates the development of self-analysis and critical evaluation of one's own behavior. Patients learn to analyze their reactions and beliefs, as well as to recognize how their thoughts and behavior impact their lives. This allows patients to better understand their emotions and build healthier relationships with those around them. But there are still medications in the world. Let's explore when and how medications can help in the treatment of paranoid personality disorder. Let's delve into the world of medication for treating paranoid personality disorder 
and explore how it can be helpful. Imagine how you would feel if every day you believed that everyone around you was hostile. In such conditions, ordinary life becomes a real challenge. PPD is exactly such a disorder where suspicion and distrust can permeate every part of life. So how can medications assist in this complex situation? First of all, remember that medications are not the primary form of treatment, but rather an adjunctive tool. The main focus should be on psychotherapy, but medications can indeed play a crucial role. Let's take a closer look at which drugs might be helpful and in which cases. Let's start with antidepressants. It may seem that antidepressants are intended only for treating depression, but they can also be useful in PPD, especially when the disorder is accompanied by symptoms of depression or anxiety. Think about it. If you are suffering from constant stress and anxiety, how might this affect your paranoid thoughts? It's an additional burden on the psyche. Antidepressants can reduce overall stress and anxiety, which in turn can alleviate PPD symptoms. For example, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs like sertraline or fluoxetine, can help improve mood and reduce anxiety. Have you ever heard about how serotonin affects our perception of the world? These medications help normalize serotonin levels in the brain, which can indirectly reduce paranoid ideas. Serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs like venlafaxine, can also be effective, especially when symptoms include both depression and anxiety. Now let's talk about antipsychotic medications. These drugs can be useful if a patient exhibits pronounced psychotic symptoms. If you are experiencing obsessive thoughts that are hard to control, these medications may help reduce their intensity. Typical antipsychotics like chlorpromazine were once very popular for treating psychosis, but their side effects make them less common today. However, atypical antipsychotics such as risperidone or olanzapine may be more effective for controlling paranoid symptoms with fewer side effects. Consider this. If these medications can help you see the world more clearly, wouldn't it be better to use them? Benzodiazepines are another class of medications that may help with PPD. They can be used for short-term relief of anxiety. For example, diazepam or lorazepam can provide quick calmness. But it's important to remember, long-term use of benzodiazepines is not recommended due to the risk of dependence and other side effects. Think of this as a temporary solution when you need to quickly manage anxiety, but it doesn't address the problem in the long term. Medication for PPD requires careful control and monitoring. You cannot just start taking medications and forget about it. A specialist must regularly check how the drugs are working and what side effects might occur. Each person reacts to medications differently, and it's important to find the optimal approach based on the patient's individual needs. But the most important thing to remember is, medications are just one part of the treatment. Psychotherapy remains the primary method for addressing PPD. Medications can alleviate symptoms, but for long-term improvement and changing paranoid beliefs, deep work with a psychotherapist is necessary. Thus, medication plays an adjunctive role in treating paranoid personality disorder. It helps alleviate accompanying symptoms and improve the patient's quality of life. But to achieve the best results, treatment should be comprehensive and include psychotherapeutic approaches. I hope this gives you a clearer understanding of how medications can help in treating PPD and why psychotherapy remains the primary tool in this process. Thank you, Professor. Continuing our discussion, I would like to hear your thoughts on the prognosis for patients with paranoid personality disorder when they receive timely treatment. When we talk about the prognosis for individuals with paranoid personality disorder, let's explore the factors that can influence how their treatment will progress. You might wonder about the chances of improvement with this disorder. Well, the prognosis can vary significantly depending on various aspects. But don't worry, I'll explain how to enhance the chances of successful treatment. First and foremost, consider the timeliness of starting treatment. Imagine you catch a cold. If you start taking medicine as soon as you notice the first symptoms, you're much more likely to recover quickly. Similarly, with PPD, the earlier you start treatment, the sooner you can begin working on changing negative thoughts and behaviors. Early intervention helps prevent more severe problems such as chronic isolation or difficulties in interpersonal relationships. In other words, 
Early treatment helps avoid serious complications. Now let's discuss psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is like the main tool in the toolkit for treating PPD. One of the most effective methods is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Imagine you have a skeleton in the closet that you can't remove because you don't see its real shape. CBT helps you recognize and change distortions in perception that reinforce paranoid thoughts. Over time, with persistent practice, you can see your thoughts in a new light and learn healthier ways to interact with others. It's not a quick process, but with perseverance and patience, you will see significant changes. Let's not forget about social support. Think about how you would feel if you had no one to support you in tough times. Support from family and friends helps manage stress, reduces feelings of isolation, and improves adherence to medical recommendations. A positive environment can significantly enhance your condition. If you have people willing to support and help you, that's already half the battle towards successful treatment. It is also crucial for patients to actively participate in their treatment. This includes not only attending psychotherapy sessions, but also adhering to medication regimens if prescribed. Think of treatment as a team effort. The more you collaborate with your therapist, the higher your chances of success. Timely identification and correction of issues is like planning a route on a trip. You need to continuously adjust the path to stay on course. Also, consider the individual resources and resilience of the patient. People with good coping mechanisms, strong motivation, and supportive social connections may adapt better to therapy and achieve more stable results. It's like tuning your car for optimal performance. Everything needs to work in harmony to achieve the best results. Each person is unique, and everyone has their path to recovery. Now let's look at possible treatment outcomes. With adequate therapy, many patients can significantly reduce the severity of their symptoms. This might include decreased suspicion, improved social skills, and enhanced overall functioning. Ultimately, this leads to a significant improvement in quality of life. You will start building healthier relationships, feel more confident, and manage daily tasks more effectively. However, it's important to remember that some patients may experience chronic symptoms that require long-term management. While complete cure may be challenging, even in such cases, treatment helps improve symptoms and increase functionality. Relapses can occur, especially in stressful situations or in the absence of support. But regular psychotherapy sessions and adherence to medication can help manage relapses and minimize their impact on the patient's life. In conclusion, the prognosis for patients with paranoid personality disorder with timely and appropriate treatment is generally positive. Many achieve significant improvement and learn to manage symptoms. But it's essential to remember that treatment requires time, patience, and active patient participation. Support from professionals, family, and friends plays a key role in achieving stable and positive results. I hope you now have a better understanding of how to improve the prognosis for individuals with PPD and why a comprehensive approach to treatment is crucial. Thank you for the engaging and insightful discussion on paranoid personality disorder, Professor Nicholas Schneider. As we wrap up today's episode, could you provide a summarizing conclusion? What key points would you like to highlight for our listeners, and what should they remember about paranoid personality disorder and its treatment? Thank you, Ian. To conclude our discussion on paranoid personality disorder, let's summarize and highlight some key points. Firstly, it's crucial to understand that PPD is not just a matter of peculiar behavior or quirks. It's a serious mental health condition that can significantly impact a person's quality of life and interactions with others. People with this disorder live in a constant state of distrust and suspicion, which often leads to social isolation and numerous conflicts. However, the outlook is not all bleak. With timely and appropriate treatment, the results can be very promising. Psychotherapy, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is central to treating PPD. CBT helps patients alter distorted thoughts that create and sustain paranoid ideas and develop healthier, more productive ways of interacting with others. It's like refreshing an old style. Changing the design of thought can make life look different. Medication also plays a role, though it is not the primary method. It can be especially useful if the patient has accompanying symptoms such as depression or anxiety. 
Medications help alleviate these symptoms, but remember, they work in tandem with psychotherapy. Don't forget the importance of social support. Family and friends act as a strong framework supporting the structure. They help the patient manage stress and reduce feelings of isolation. This is crucial not only for emotional well-being, but also for the overall treatment prognosis. Social support can be the fuel that helps push forward and overcome difficulties. Finally, active patient participation in their treatment is a key aspect of success. Following medical advice, attending therapy sessions regularly, and receiving support from loved ones all contribute to achieving positive outcomes. It's like teamwork. The more involved everyone is, the higher the chances of success. So, despite the challenges and difficulties, with the right approach, patience, and support, many people with PPD can achieve significant improvement and lead fulfilling lives. I hope this information has been helpful and provided you with a better understanding of how to manage this serious disorder. Thank you for your attention and interest in this topic. Dear listeners, and so our episode of the Sexual Health Podcast has come to an end. Today, we delved into one of the most complex and multifaceted topics, paranoid personality disorder. I hope this episode has helped you gain a better understanding of what PPD is, how it affects people's lives, and what treatment methods can lead to positive outcomes. It's important to remember that this disorder should not remain in the shadows. Understanding and support can play a significant role in the lives of those dealing with PPD. We discussed how timely treatment, psychotherapy, medications, and of course, the support of loved ones can greatly improve quality of life. If you have any lingering questions or want to learn more, don't hesitate to reach out to specialists. Treating paranoid personality disorder is a journey that requires time and patience, but with the right approach and support, many individuals can achieve substantial improvement. That concludes our episode. I want to extend my gratitude to our guest, as well as to you, our dear listeners, for your attention and interest. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to our podcast, rate us, and leave your feedback. Your opinions are very important to us and help us make our episodes even better. See you in the next episode of the Sexual Health Podcast. Take care of yourselves and your loved ones, and remember, your health and well-being are always in your hands. This is Ian Storm signing off. Until next time.